Well, it's good to have Brent Sandy back on the podcast again this week. Uh, thank you so much for joining us once again. Well, you're very welcome, and my thrill to be here. You're doing so, a good, great job. Well, so last week we talked about just the importance of understanding Scripture and especially hearing it, right? But and and how that's so important, and how. God spoke the world into existence. Uh, but this week, I wanted to kind of drill down on how do we hear the Word of God, and not just I'm not just talking about opening the Dwell Bible app and listening to it being read, but hearing with a heart to obey and a heart to uh, that really wants to be impacted. It, speak to this for a moment. Is there you know it feels like sometimes you can have two people that hear the same thing but come away with very different takes. How do we hear uh, the word of God in a way that is transformative to our lives? Well, that's a very, very important question and not an easy question to answer um, because we're not, we're not, uh, what should I say? We're not programmed to hear things and contemplate them and understand them very well. That's just not part of our culture. Um, I, I have a... <laughs> I've never played the game Bridge, but our local newspaper every night has this little series on strategies for playing Bridge. Well, I know nothing about this game. Um, I know it's called Bridge. I don't know why it's called Bridge. And here's a paragraph out of Instructions and Strategy. After a one no trump opening, some pairs use a jump response of three of a major to show game values with a singleton or void in that suit, three cards in the other major, and five four or five five in the minors. Declarer has seven top tricks, two spades, four diamonds, goes on and on and on. I have no idea what I'm reading. <laughs> I know those words. I know what the word jump means. I could do a word study on singleton, try to figure out what that means. But these sentences together like that make no sense to me because I don't know anything about the, the game. So to get into God's word and have that impress, transform, help me to become a better person, to become a true Christian, to become a better true Christian, I need to sort of get on the wavelength of that game that we're playing in Scripture. Now, that's not a good way to say it, a game we're not playing in Scripture. Right, you know right. I mean? Trying to make this analogy here. So how do I get the strategy of the Christian life out of Scripture unless I'm really into understanding Scripture. So, a lot of this is being acquainted with Scripture in its larger dimensions, being you know, well-read in Scripture. Um, so let's start with the Gospels. To read the Gospels, to read all four of them, then you begin to pick up what Jesus is doing in the Gospels. So very early on in the Gospels, Jesus is sort of freely inviting people, come follow me. And at that time in Jesus' day, it was, a, it was a common thing for a rabbi to be inviting people to join him and become part of his team or followers or something like that. So Jesus is very initially saying, okay, come follow me. And, you know, they leave, leave, leave things behind and start following him. But then through the Gospels, you see Jesus start raising the stakes. Now, if you want to follow me, here's what's expected. You're going to have to count the cost, you know. You're going to have to carry your cross, you know. And so the sort of structure of the Gospels is taking us along in the process of gathering things that are going to change me because as I'm following the story of the Gospels, I'm picking up on this strategy that Jesus is using in getting his followers to really become true followers. So I'm not sure that's answering your question very well. Yeah. It's part of the way to get on the on the wavelength of Scripture by following the themes of Scripture so that I know where this is going and then I can interact more closely with passages I'm reading. 
it's funny. Oh. Whenever I speak, I always think the, the introduction takes the most amount of work. If I can understand where Ephesians is going or Galatians is going, then the, the rest of the message kind of just naturally, it's the same with a book, right? You have a great outline and you kind of know where you're going. It really helps, right? Laying that, that foundation. And so I, I feel like scripture is very similar. When you understand kind of the meta narrative, you understand the overarching story, and then you start saying, okay, so this is, so here's the big picture story, but then that's how this piece here fits into the, the grand picture. And then it starts to, the Bible starts to come alive in a fresh way. Um, one of the things you write here, you said, if scripture was directed to them, uh, yet for us, um, then we need to become them, meaning those who had received the, the scripture and the, you know, back then, uh, before we can be us. It calls us to think our way back into their world so we can be more than eavesdroppers. Easier said than done, but how, how would you say for the average Christian that's listening to this and they don't feel like going to necessarily a commentary every time they open God's word, how do we do this? Yes, well, that's a very good question. Um, I think we're blessed to have great study Bibles right now and say the cultural study Bible, which is one of my favorite Bibles, cultural Bibles or study Bibles, the cultural background study Bible. Um, as I use this, that it gives me footnotes and introductions that help me to think my way back into their culture. So, you know, you travel abroad today into another culture and you need some cultural intelligence because over there, you're going to make a cultural faux pas if you don't know certain things about that culture. So my wife and I have two sons who both live in Europe, so we often go to Europe, and I have to readjust my thinking when I'm in France and when I'm in England or when I'm in Germany about the way they do things there. So in some cultures, to have your hand in your pocket when you're talking to somebody is the wrong thing to do. Or in some cultures, to lay your bread on the table rather than on your plate is saying something. Hmm. So there's different cultural things today in our different cultures. So the Bible is 2,000 years old. It comes from a vastly different culture. So we're really, we need to get into that frame of mind. So the oral, as oral aspect, their oral culture is part of that. But there's much more than that. Now, you say, that's a lot for an everyday Christian. And, well, yes, I agree. Um, if you want to understand Shakespeare, can you just open it up and read it as he originally wrote it? Well, no. You have to do something to understand Shakespeare. And the Bible is that much older than Shakespeare, of course. So there is a bit of that says extra material that's needed right. in Scripture to sort of put us in that culture, to think our way back into that culture. So Corey we, DeLeon, a couple of weeks ago, she was on her podcast, and she talked about the Swiss Alps. Use that analogy, right, where, you know, you anyone, if whether you understand it deeply or you it's just your first time, you can still appreciate it, right, because there's you can never exhaust the understanding that you have of the Swiss Alps. And she likened that to, the, to Scripture as well. I think that's a pretty good metaphor because sometimes, you know, some people listening to this, they're saying, I've never read through the Bible once in my life, right? Mm -hmm. I've read maybe the Gospel of John, and that's about it. Others, they've read through it multiple times, right? But I do think, you know, in our small group, we were going over Hebrews 5 and 6 this last week, and just the, talking about the importance of spiritual maturity. Um, and it feels like one of the, those primary marks is that that hungering, right? That the hungering for God's word and to dig a little bit deeper, not just settle, settle for those little ideas that we, you know, that we have always known, but to, to really hunger. If someone is listening to this and they don't have that hunger, maybe they've been a Christian for a while, and but they've really just struggled to have that hunger to dig deeper into God's word. And they've kind of just kind of put their hands up and said, well, you know, I'm just going to stay where I'm at. What's, what's a nudge you would offer that would just maybe be a little prompt that, that might, might be helpful to them today? Well, yes. Scripture, if we just sort of read it or somebody else reads it even to us 
there's a certain flatness that can come from it. That is, it's just words on a page. It's dead ink on dead pieces of wood or paper comes from wood and so forth. So there's, there's no life in Scripture, potentially, if we're not priming ourselves to expect some life to come out of Scripture. So if we read Scripture just sort of to fulfill a quota, I'm going to read through the Bible, or I'm going to read because the pastor or Sunday school teacher said I'm supposed to read that. It's easy for that to become sort of well, not meaningless, but empty. It just doesn't have much oomph to it. So that's a risk with reading Scripture. Now, there's several ways to help us in that. One is different translations. A translation such as the voice message. Um, the voice translation was written especially for public performance or even the message translation puts it in very lively terminology. At least the New Living Translation. So a different translation will, all, will often help us sort of, oh, I, I want to see what that said in my other version. So then we start investigating a little bit more scripture. So different versions can ignite more of a passion in understanding God's word. Of course, I think we should pray for it. I think we should ask God to give us that. Holy Spirit, please help me today to find something that be meaningful and helpful in this passage of Scripture. And then, of course, the idea of hearing Scripture. I think if we can get a new dimension of Scripture being not just something we read, meeting a quota, but we're hearing it, and we're hearing it expressed lively, dynamically, expressively, I think all those things can help us get to the point of getting over the sort of tired reading of Scripture because I have to kind of thing. Yeah. Last podcast, you talked about, uh, well, we turned to John 1. You basically said, hey, you want me to read it in English or Greek, right? Or away we go. So I, I feel like you can answer this question better than a lot of others can. You've obviously studied, especially the New Testament, at so many different layers, right? You understand what it means to read in black and white and then also color, right, through reading and studying in Greek. Uh, as you've gone this, has there ever been a point where, let's stick with the New Testament, has become super dry to you, and it's felt like, ah, man, it, where, where it was almost a drudgery to approach God's Word, or did you never have one of those moments? If I read it because I'm trying to meet a quota, because I know I'm supposed to, because I have to, because I feel like other people are wanting to know, what did you read today, or whatever. If I read it for the wrong reasons, then it's kind of going to be for the wrong reasons. It's not going to result in much reason, much help. So for me, like I suggest, there's different ways to get at Scripture that make it um, inspiring, encouraging, enticing, stimulating. So one of those ways is, you know, because I can look at the Greek, but most people can't do that. But maybe somebody that does know Spanish or French can read it in that version and compare it with their English version. Yeah. And so you start making some comparisons and you say, oh, I wonder why that's translated that way. It sounds a little bit different in different languages and different translations. And then study Bibles, when you have a study Bible that gives these notes and so forth. Oh, now I see what's going on in that passage because mm -hmm. you get a little help in understanding that. So we just have a wealth of helps right now that, you know, they're available online, they're available in books and our Bibles and so forth. I just think study Bibles are such a great asset to Christians today. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's great. Because, I, I mean, I've, I've bumped into that a time or two. I'll, I'll be studying along, and and then I'm like, oh, man, it, it starts to become kind of a drudgery. I, I think of I think it's Daniel Kahneman or Kahneman, I forget, where he wrote uh, a book on, like, thinking fast and slow. Right, And I sometimes think of Scripture that way, of reading fast and slow, that, as we were talking about last time, entire books of the Bible were meant to be heard, right, and, and listened to all in one setting. And that's super helpful. And then sometimes I'll be reading, whether it's Psalm 34 or Psalm 37, and then all of a sudden I'll slow down and say, oh, wait, wait, I got I to gotta pause here. Uh, do you find that, it, how do you do that? Because you talked about last time about the importance of, listening to an entire book in context. But in your personal worship time with God, do you just sit with a couple verses? Do you tend to read whole chapters? What, what do you typically do? Uh, 
No, I don't save with a couple verses. I much prefer to take in larger swaths of things. So I may not read a whole book, um, even you know, even a short book, but I will definitely read at least a chapter, if not two, because I, I'm more interested in the flow of thought, where this is going, than I am in taking apart a particular verse. So, um, for me, it's not a verse. It's at least a chapter. Yeah. So, what I'm reading, say, in the Gospels, which is my favorite thing to read, because I just want to hear Jesus. I want to think the way Jesus does. I want to be like Jesus was. I want to speak like Jesus did. So, I want to read at least uh, one of the episodes, one of the pericopes, we call it, from his life. So, I may just read, you know, 15 or 20 verses, because that sort of captures that one story he told or one event in his life, and then take that in. That, I think, okay. is a greater priority. So I'm curious on this. This wasn't in my notes here, but I, I, I'd like to get your take on this. Sometimes I hear all these different debates that are happening in the church world. I don't know whether it's, you know, I'll, I won't mention anyone so we don't go on a rabbit trail, but you hear all these different debates, maybe on secondary or tertiary issues sometimes, right? And I feel like sometimes the root of these debates is a different is not just the text itself, but an approach to how you read the text as a whole, where if you isolate one or two passages and you make that the foundation for your belief of this, right? Um, okay, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Uh, let, let's take First uh, Timothy 2, right? 3, Women in Ministry, right? It feels like sometimes I've heard people, they'll use that passage. And my personally, I'd lead more egalitarian, so women in ministry. Um, but they would take that passage, right? And they would say, okay, so this is clearly what Paul is saying here, right? But then other passages, they would say, well, no, you understand we have to have context, right? We have to have context. What does it mean that all people are saved and things like that? So I'm not, I'm not necessarily discussing that particular issue, but how do we, I guess, how do we get out of that trap where we don't cherry pick and say, okay, you know what? These things that I'm really passionate about, these will be my proof text. But then the things that, oh, I don't know about that, then I'll say, okay, then we need context and we need to understand scripture as a whole. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Because I feel like this is a big problem. And how, how do we avoid it? Well, I agree totally. And number one, I'd like to point out, remind you and others what Jesus says is in prayer in John 17. May they all be one, Father, as you and I are one. Um, that's part of his prayer. So he's really praying a lot for the unity of the body of Christ. And, of course, Paul emphasizes that, emphasizes that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, we hear it again in Philippians. We hear it again in Ephesians. The emphasis on the unity of the body. So we are, we're only going to have unity as a body if we stand firm for the defining doctrines of our Christian faith. Those things we agree on, those things we're not going to battle over. Um, we're not even going to question those things. Those things define us. They have for centuries. What we don't want to do is get caught up in, like you say, tertiary, secondary issues and make those questions of faith or make those battlegrounds or something like that. We've got to stay focused on the unity of the body as opposed to what denominational differences or something like that, different ways to baptize, different ways to um, worship and you know all these kinds of things. Worship wars and what uh, it's too bad that the body of Christ and it's part of our individualism that leads to this because people think individualistically rather than collectively. We don't think so much as a larger group of people in the body of Christ. So the issue you mentioned, um, that's just an example of the kinds of things that we can get very divisive about and get critical of each other because that person holds a different view, egalitarian, complementarian, whatever, and that that's harmful to the body. So one of the ways I think we avoid that is do what they did in the ancient world. They heard a whole book or more, and they didn't stop and finagle, what should I say? You know, you take a rose into the laboratory and dissect it, and it loses its fragrance. And, and that happens in Scripture when Scripture 
is taken apart piece by piece, um, we need to be less microscopic and more macroscopic mm. as we think about, understand, and read Scripture. Yeah, so we'll, we'll never get beyond some of those debates on different right. issues. Um, and it's unfortunate that that's yeah. true. No, no, no. That's that, that's fascinating. It, it's it, yeah. Well, there's a lot I could say there, so uh, I'll keep moving on here. One of the th things you write, you say, interpreting scripture orally has the potential of bridging some of the gap between academy and church. Much of what scholars do in their re research is beyond the reach of people in the church. But if academy and church can join together in seeking to interpret scripture orally. Both will benefit. And, and I've thought about this a lot because I have friends that are strong in the academic setting. Uh, Wheaton College, for example, right? And, and people that spend their lives just studying, right? And so appreciative of that. Then I have others that are super, everything's super practical. Okay, how can we impact our communities? And how can we do this in the most effective way possible? I'd probably be somewhere in the middle, right? Because I have a little bit of an academic background, but I'm trying to apply it to everyday people, right? Um, how do we bridge those worlds together? What's, what's the importance of oral, in, in oral communication? How does that help us do that? Well, a lot of the work of scholars is what I would call this microscopic approach to Scripture. It is very much taking Scripture apart piece by piece. It's commentaries that are thousands of pages on, you know, a book or something like that, Book of Daniel or something like that. Um, and that scholarly work is beyond the scope of the average Christian. Your weekday Christian, your everyday Christian, is not going to appreciate that, probably can't understand that. Um, and so that's, that's an extreme example. Um, I think that if scholars would be give, be give, give more attention to the oral culture of things and interpreting things orally, they would do less of that deep drilled exegesis. Um, I'm not saying that's all wrong to do that. Yeah. It, it, it's out of balance, I think. No, I, I, I've picked up how many times. I think so. I think Scott McKnight had him on a while ago. To me, he was a great example of this. And he talked about this where he struggled with that for a while, where he would write strictly academic, but then realized, oh, well, it's not touching anyone, right? It's not impacting. And so I guess increasingly, and there's a fine line here because there is importance of rich truths and, you know, the academic study. But I do think I, I, the older I get, the more I appreciate someone who can take something deeply profound and convey it in a way that pe people in different layers can understand, right? People, and because scripture does this, scripture does this. And I think someone an average person should be able to understand what you're saying, but then someone who's a little bit more along the way, so to, so to speak, they understand the deeper truths also of what you're trying to convey as well. I mean, you're, you've written how much, how, how have you done this? I mean, well, it's difficult, sure isn't it? Very well, so I, you know, in writing this particular book, I tried to write it so that anybody, everybody, every day Christian can read and understand it. But I have had some people say that, uh, I got bogged down. It got too deep for me. It's too heavy. And so, yeah. Oh, no. no. <laughs> so I said, well, jump ahead. You run into a, something like that. Well, jump ahead. There's some better chapters ahead in the book or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Get them to keep reading, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think Jesus is a great model for this because he could speak in ways that kept the scholars in Pressed or overwhelmed or puzzled or whatever. At the same time, it was communicating to the people in ways that they could understand. So if we can yeah. communicate a little bit more like Jesus did, and that's that's often telling stories. Right. Get a point across by illustrating it rather than trying to, you know, speak so deeply about it. Well, it's like if we communicate in here, if you say something and then my brow kind of furls over, I'm like, you know, well, immediately you're going to say, well, okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? Right. And we do that naturally with oral communication. Sometimes you get alone by yourself, though. I've been guilty of this. You get alone by yourself and you start writing and you go down this rabbit trail and you think, oh, man, this is so good. And meanwhile, it's 
probably going to impact four people <laughs> and, yeah. and not, not the world. Yeah. Yeah. I know that there's, there's so much to that. Um, we've hit on so many different things. Uh, just as we wrap this all up, bring it to a close. Um, I'll, I'll read one more thing that you wrote. You said, since the majority of even <laughs> since the majority of evangel evangelistic activities in the United States for the past 50 years uh, have focused on sudden conversion and methods that arise from this viewpoint. The challenge to the church is to develop more holistic ways of outreach that take into account the fact that the majority of people come to faith slowly, uh, not suddenly. And I thought, man, that's, that's beautiful. Um, maybe just in closing, how do we develop a more holistic view of outreach? How does the oral communication of scripture help us do that? Well, I don't think we're very good about taking the stories that Jesus told and then learning them well enough that we can retell them without having a Bible in front of us. So you're sitting in an airplane or something like that. And, you know, you probably prayed for this person next to you. You don't know if he's a Christian or not, um, or she, and you, you pray a little bit. Well, I, maybe God, give me an opportunity here to say something. It would be worthwhile. And so maybe you say, you know, in the midst of some conversation, uh, you ever heard this story? It's a story Jesus told. Let me tell you what the story Jesus told. And so you recount a story that Jesus told. And maybe you drop it at that. Maybe the person say, okay, that's a nice story. Um, you don't grab that person by the neck and say, okay, now I want you to accept Jesus as your Savior right now. Um, so there's a bit of storytelling that God can use to get people started to think about him. So we're dropping pebbles in the pond and eventually that big log might get enough of a drift to move across that pond mm. so it takes piecemeal oftentimes for somebody to come to true faith so in our neighborhood right now um, there's a guy that i've been walking with every other day walk and talk for about an hour and he's not a christian and I'm just trying to encourage him, just trying to get together. He was in jail some. He's had a problem with alcoholism. And so I'm just reaching out to him. And I'm trying to nudge him in the direction of spiritual things. Yeah. Uh, I can't come on too strong. I'm afraid he'll you know, blow me away. Um, but I'm, I'm just dropping this as little bit as I can yeah. to encourage him. Yeah. I think telling stories especially the story Jesus told, but there's other great stories in the Bible, of course, as well, that would be illustrative, that would get somebody's attention and help them come eventually to true faith. Yeah. No, that's... And each of us has individual context, right? And just as the disciples, you know, they're yes. given the commission to, all right, here, here's how I've lived. Now take this to the nations. I mean, I think of that profoundly that, you know, in our neighborhoods, our communities, we have the opportunity to do that as well, right? right? To take Jesus and and be basically his mouthpiece in a way to, to, to those around us. And so That's good. Be his mouthpiece. Yeah. As yeah. he's spokesman, then we are spokesmen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brent Sandy, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, we'll link to everything in the show notes below that people can check out your resources. And uh, thanks for making me think. And I, I'm going to guess you made a lot in our audience think as well. Well, praise God. I hope so. And God bless your ministries. It's great to know you, Ezra.